Taizo. Start the adventure here. The first time we've been brought to tears. That was tough. My legs just seized up from about 40 miles. The rugged beauty of Scotland, from the majestic mountains of Glencoe through the twists and turns of Glen Tilt into the meandering floodplains of the Dee Valley and beyond. It's 190 miles of the most challenging terrain Scotland has to offer, and a challenge which more than 120 top endurance athletes are prepared to accept. The Scottish Coast to Coast Triathlon, comprising the three disciplines of running, cycling and canoeing, has been designed to test competitors to the limit, and they've come from all over the world to try. Balahulish on the west coast is the starting point for the event, now in its second year. The brainchild of race organiser, Jim Stark. Well, I'm very pleased because the entry has uh, greatly increased this year. I've, uh, last year we had uh, 54 pioneers, as I like to term them. But this year we have uh, well over the 100, we have uh, 125 entrants uh, made up of 17 teams of two and over 90 individuals. So uh, each day there will be over 100 people on the start line. Good humoured banter is to the fore at the coast to coast pre-race registration ritual. It comes mixed with the athletes knowledge they're about to embark on something special and stirred with those stomach somersaulting pre-race nerves which say what they're about to do might also hurt a bit as well. It's very difficult, uh, the length of the, the, the each leg, I mean 100 miles of cycling, 20 miles of running, really you have to race your own, at your own pace. The competitors will be kept in the pink over the next few days by an army of backup supporters with a car boot convoy packed with equipment and supplies. There's a definite Antipodean accent to proceedings in the car park this year, no strangers themselves to coast-to-coast -to -coast competition down under. Our race analyst, international runner Fraser Klein, says the homegrown talent feels the Kiwi contingent pose one of the biggest threats. We don't know much about them, but um, quite a few of them have a lot of experience of having done the, the New Zealand coast-to-coast -coast race, and that was something John McKenzie had from last year, and if they're of similar or even better ability to him, then obviously they're going to be main contenders. Days end then, and the traditional pasta party provides the opportunity for competitors to try to unwind and load up on carbohydrate. Food for thought before tomorrow's trials. From Balahulish, a three-mile run is calculated to break up the field. Then at Glencoe Village, the competitors take to their bikes for a 90-mile cycle through the historic pass guarded by some of Scotland's most dramatic mountain scenery. From there, they cross desolate Lanark Moor, and after reaching Tangram, it's on to the falls at Kalin before heading along Loch Tay. The route then takes them to Tamil Bridge and on to the historic pass of Killycranky, only five miles from the finish line. The day's work ends in the grounds of Blair Castle, a staggering 93 miles the target for day one. Well, the weather's the only thing calm here in Balahulish as these athletes eagerly await the sound that'll pierce the morning air, signalling the start of this marathon event. Three, two, one. And already as they head out of Balahulish for the three-mile run to Glencoe Village, it's number 86, John O'Donovan, powering ahead. In fact, this is a repeat of last year when he got off to an early lead, reaching the changeover point a minute ahead of the pack. Back then, of course, he was entered in the team event, so didn't do all three days. If he had, though, he'd certainly have posed a serious threat to last year's winner, John McKenzie, from New Zealand. The best of the chasing pack now about 200 yards behind the race leaders and the rest spreading well back beyond that. 
There's number 94, Jackie Shand from Stonehaven, the same town as John O'Donovan. The coincidences don't end there though, as well as being neighbours, O'Donovan is also Jackie's coach. It's a good women's race this year, a very competitive field. The main threat to Jackie probably going to come from Gina Vaughan, the Leicester swimming instructor who won the women's section last year. Now, things starting to hot up at the head of the field, O'Donovan approaching Glencoe Village and itching to transfer to bike. So, as O'Donovan heads off, here's the second place man, number four, Gary Westhead from Blackpool. Steve Lumley finished fourth last year. And behind him, the Frenchman, Pierre Fromentil. And here's one of the competition's real characters, Robbie Van Want, a soldier from New Zealand. Perhaps not wearing the best camouflage today, though. Robbie, a big Pink Panther fan, he's an experienced multi-sports athlete, competed many times in New Zealand's endurance events, and like most of the Kiwi contingent here, very much looking forward to the kayaking section on day three. <laughs> There's another Kiwi, Bruce Bunny, the oldest man in the race at 67. He's competing alongside his daughter Debbie. There she is, number 96. Says she's here for a good view of Scotland. She'll certainly get that over the next few days. Now, right up at the head of the field, determination written all over John O'Donovan's face. He's got a clear two minute lead. No doubt about it, one of the favourites to win the competition this year. The Scottish triathlon team coach, he's totally dedicated to the sport. Every spare moment away from his job in the oil industry, spent training, coaching or taking part in multi-sport events. Over the bridge at Killin, more than halfway through this testing route now. Killin, of course, famous for its waterfalls. A suitable location then for the first water station. There's plenty on offer as the competitors leave the village. Back with the leader, O'Donovan pushing pumping those legs, showing no signs of fatigue, increasing his lead all the time. Second place, Martin Tong, concentrating hard on the task ahead, and what a task, he's now a good eight minutes behind. The conditions here, absolutely perfect, no sign of rain and only the slightest breeze. Climbing uphill before Tumble Bridge, O'Donovan really benefiting from the bike he's borrowed from Olympic cyclist Sarah Phillips. The lower gear ratio making the going much easier. At the moment on the back, I got a 12.21. And on the front, 53.39. Last year I was over geared on that hill. 
It's a lot easier this time. Down into Tamil Bridge, 75 miles gone, just 15 left to race. Fourteen minutes behind the leader, here's Chris McSweeney. He's had seven second place finishes in endurance events over the past two years. His ambition, not surprisingly, to finish first. Now, this is an interesting character, little Antonio Fizarro. With a name like that, you won't be surprised to learn he's of Italian descent. Lives in London now, though. Came second in the Ironman Scotland event last year with a strong chance here. Here's Jackie Shand, almost 24 minutes behind O'Donovan, but still well up the field. Pierre Fromentiel, nearest the camera as they approach the bridge, suffered a puncture on the third day last year. He'll be going all out to avoid a repeat of that. Steve Lumley pushing hard through Tamil, much slower than last year though, obviously finding the going extremely tough. Of course, if you're not used to the intricacies of the Scottish countryside, life can be pretty confusing. It's the other way, guys. Wrong way, is it? Oh, no. <laughs> I was right. <laughs> Tricky the other day, wasn't he? Oh dear, even our camera crew can't help number 11, Lindsay Young from Aberdeen. His inner tubing's gone. Sounds painful, certainly is time-wise. I don't even like cycling. This is just confirming it. I would have really rather had Alpine bikes come along than uh, the TV camera. At Blair Castle, the finish point for today's leg, the crowd waiting patiently, being entertained in the most traditional style. The first athlete within sight, and no surprise really, given his massive early lead, John O'Donovan now within the castle grounds. Just a final few yards left on the bike. The end can't come soon enough for this man. He really has put in a superhuman effort today. Now a short sprint to the finish and still looking full of energy. What a performance from the 47-year-old. In the O'Donovan crossing the line, clocking up a staggering 90 miles in just 4 hours, 29 minutes and 23 seconds. The run went as I planned. Uh, I just trotted along at the pace I intended to, to run at. Um, the bike went okay. I didn't really, wasn't really that happy for the first hour or so on the bike. Uh, pretty bad headache back here. I've had it for a few days now. But uh, once I got to Tindrum and the sun came out, um, things brightened up a little bit. Back on the road then, Pierre Fromentiel, just like his cooking, can smell the finish line ahead. Five more kilometers. In front of him though, it's Lancashire's Martin Tong, about to reach the line. Uh, it was hard actually, yeah. Because considering we were supposed to have a tailwind, it was, uh, it was very hard. It's from uh, locked A, it seemed to be you know, struggling all the time. But I was just glad to get back. <laughs> and he can be very proud too. A finishing time of just over four hours and 42 minutes. He's in great shape for the next two legs. No, I'll be all right in a minute. Antonio Fizarro, well, his two legs carrying him towards the line in determined style. That determination etched all over his face. 
cycling not his strongest sport. That'll come tomorrow with the 28-mile run. Tomorrow I, I hope I have a good race. Today was the warm-up and I'm as well very pleased the kayak section is shortened. Chris McSweeney, fourth across the line. He's still well on target to fulfil his ambition of top oh, honours nice by the end of day three. Nice uh, well last two miles of hard work. <laughs> I was just about, just about blowing on them. Uh, good. So. You've done well. <laughs> Athletes starting to reach the finish in greater numbers now. And the first woman nearing home, Jackie Shand. Just that final sprint ahead. Yeah, the last four miles were quite hard because I got a bit of a headwind. But uh, no, I was, I was fairly strong the whole way. I think it, I was taking the food properly and everything, you know. The fluid intake was quite good, so quite pleased, no stomach problems. <laughs> and look at poor old Steve Lumley, obviously in a great deal of pain, but I'm sure he'll bounce back tomorrow. Still many of the tail enders to cross the line. The agony won't be over for some time yet. Not just a test of their physical ability, but their mental stamina as well. Oh, it's four. Four. So how was it then? Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how was it for you? Are you happy? No, oh, definitely now it's finished. <laughs> Those last few hills were pretty well. They were pretty tough, that's for sure. Lots to talk about at the end of day one, but the grins and grimaces at the finish line tell their own story. For some, it may have been miles of smiles, others a saddle sore saga. It's the first time we've been brought to tears. Yeah? That was tough. I'd like to thank Jim Stark for killing me. <laughs> he did a good job. Many a team has tried and failed, but he did it today. It was tough. So much for the Kiwi challenge then. <laughs> Here though, in the first day field hospital is where the casualties converge. On hand to massage muscles tortured by the trail, a team of physiotherapists squeezing the rigors of the race away. Those suffering today would feel twice as bad tomorrow without treatment and a good night's rest in a warm bed is all they really need. Coast to coasting it though means roughing it as well, and for most of the athletes, the cars and sprawl of tents which have sprung up with varying degrees of success are home. Dog tired they may be, but competitors are now under no illusions of what they've got themselves into. I cycled to work in training, but it's only 20 miles, so um, beyond 20 I didn't know how I was going to perform, but um, on the day it went very well. It was great. I mean. It's so nice to cycle through Scotland, you know, it's marvellous. The hills were hard though, very hard. <laughs> Our race analyst agrees it's been tough, but this year the standard is higher too. We've seen some excellent performances today, particularly from John O'Donovan uh, and from Jackie Shan, the men's and women's leaders. John O'Donovan actually has a time which is about 14 minutes quicker than John McKenzie, last year's winner recorded on the first day, so he's obviously on, on great form and he has an advantage now of about 13 minutes on the, the main opposition going into tomorrow's second stage. One thing's sure, all of the competitors fit enough to continue face a truly Herculean challenge tomorrow. O'Donovan, Shand, Fazaro and McSweeney. Are those the names to watch out for on day two? We continue our journey across Scotland with the Benachy Whiskey Coast to Coast after the break. Competition. Getting going in the morning is more difficult for some than others on coast to coast, since before dawn the tented village in the Blair Castle grounds has been coming to life, with support crews and competitors making ready for the next crucial stage. A night under canvas has posed no problems for Antonio Fazzaro. Limbering up for his speciality event today, the cheerful Londoner is raring to go. A month ago I did the 80 mile South Downs run. And uh, so today, 28, is, it should be OK. Steve Lumley is hoping to get motoring today, the pains in his legs easing despite just a few hours sleep. 
I basically had nothing left in my legs the last half of the bike, so I struggled, lost a lot of places. Uh, I was feeling really, really tired last night. Our race analyst, Fraser Klein, will be taking part in the run today to test the conditions for himself. The weather conditions are perfect, so there's no difficulties there. It might actually get a little bit warm, so it'll be important that everybody's well hydrated before they start and probably also that they take water with them along the route, and that's going to be quite critical, I would think. Gearing up again then for a thrilling race day, undoubtedly leaving some competitors exhausted. Day two sees the competitors returning to foot with a 28-mile hill run ahead of them. A mass start from the front of Blair Castle takes them up Glen Tilt through the ancient link to Deeside. The once thriving Glen is now virtually emptied, apart from a handful of cottages in its lower reaches, its population replaced by walkers and bikers. The runner's route takes them over the falls of Tark and the ancient bridge across the raging waters. Then it's on through some of the most rugged and remote ground they're likely to encounter before the Lynn of D comes into sight and the target for day two is ahead, a Highland Games Park at Braemar on Royal D side. So the runners off now on their gruelling trek through Glen Tilt. We can expect the head of the field to reach Braemar in about three and a half hours. As Fraser Klein said, dehydration likely to pose the biggest threat today. These athletes understand the need to pace themselves over a distance greater than a marathon and through a landscape much more challenging. The field already reduced in number from yesterday, several of the competitors unable to continue, victims of day one. So at this early stage then, who have we got? Pierre Fromentiel in the middle, left of camera number 59, Mark Lathwaite, John O'Donovan and Gary Westhead just behind, but in the red, the danger man, Douglas Runciman from Inverness Shire. Haven't seen much of him so far, the cycling not his strongest event. Finished in 47th place on the first day, but he won this stage last year. A bit further back, in this group, Jackie Shand leading the women's race. Approaching the falls of Tarf, Runciman, only 60 seconds separating him from the second place man. And it's a battling Kiwi that's taken that second place slot. Julian Charles Day lives in Edinburgh at the moment, says he just loves Scotland, and who can blame him? O'Donovan taking his turn to negotiate this rather shaky bridge. I'm sure it's quite safe though. Antonio Fizarro, a real spring in his step. 
In amongst this group, race analyst Fraser Klein. He's had a chance to sample the conditions. Hopefully we'll be able to grab a word as he comes off the bridge. How was it, Fraser? Yeah. How's it been? Great. Conditions are tremendous. Uh, sun's coming out now. I'd say the temperature's perfect as well. It's not too warm, not too cold. Uh, and everybody, I've been talking to some of the runners and they, everybody seems to be enjoying it. So far, they say, it's still a long way to go. But it's looking good just now. We'll let you go. Cheers. Cheers. What a remarkable man, hardly out of breath. The bulk of the field now reaching the falls. Let's hope the bridge can stand it. Jackie Shand, a full 21 minutes behind the leader. And a minute behind her, Gina Vaughan, racing this year to raise money for Bernardo's. There's a sign of confidence, New Zealand's Glenn Anderson finding time to take the odd holiday snap. At the Sheeling then, 10 miles into the run, here's Douglas Runciman, now well ahead of the pack. And chasing him, Gary Westhead, Mark Laithwaite, and with the designer handkerchief, number 14, Pete James from Bristol. How are you feeling, John? I'm feeling great. Who wouldn't be on a lovely day like this? Back to the darts and dominoes after this weekend. <laughs> Here's a development, Gina Vaughan now the leading woman, reaching the shilling almost 30 minutes behind Runciman. Jackie Shand behind Gina now, but less than a minute separating them, the Stonehaven athlete in hot pursuit. At the Geldy Barn, Douglas Runciman making good time. He just checks his watch to confirm that. 11 miles left to run, and he really is on target for a quick finish. Next across the barn, Pete James taking the driveway over. Very skillfully done. Gary Westhead and Mark Laithwaite, though, quite happy to make a splash. Any water, mate? Any water? O'Donovan carefully picking his way across. Doesn't want any mishaps at this stage in the competition. What a class! And just behind American Tom Lacey, Antonio Fizarro. He said day one was just a warm up. This was where his strength lay but he's well back from the leaders. Pierre, how are you getting on? Are you finding it easy? Well, I have time to stop now. I think I started a little too fast, but you know, just for the pleasure and now it's hard. Okay, see Good you. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Cramps. Are you finding it? Oh, OK, yeah, I've broken the back of it now. Just it's got a bit, a few cramps just coming down. You know, I need to get some fluid inside me and get, get rid of the, the cramps. But, yeah, we're OK. We're going to make it. Cheers. Thanks. After his second place finish on day one, Martin Tong, really struggling here, said he wasn't looking forward to the run. A lot of time to make up now. Give me a bike. You manage to keep your feet dry there. Oh, I'm trying my best. <laughs> Give me a bike any time, that's all I can say. This is too hard. <laughs> I don't want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> At the River Dee now, Runciman just six miles from home. He's used to training in the rivers around Fort William, 
cross country, road racing and hill running, the 29 year old holds course records for them all. And at last, Braemar Highland Games Park, a very welcome sight indeed for Runciman. Fitness, stamina, sheer gritty determination. He's got all those qualities in abundance. So for Douglas Runciman, a time of three hours, 27 minutes and 32 seconds. The Italian chap, I don't know his name, and O'Donovan where I went in front. I was feeling quite bad, but I managed to I managed to pull them in somehow or other, I don't quite know how, and uh, pulled a bit of a lead after that, and then it was just a case of hanging on and uh, making sure that they didn't get back to me. Second place man coming home now, Pete James, the aerodynamics engineer from Bristol. And indeed, a dynamic finish from him, just over three hours, 32. Gary Westhead, strong, relaxed, looks as though he's enjoyed himself. Lead woman Gina Vaughan, now emerging from the Lynn of D, finding the going pretty tough. They put that in to cut out that hill. <laughs> Pizarro approaching the line, disappointing race for him, 12 minutes behind the leader. It's very, very hard. In, in between, it's just a very, very rough section and uh, you're stumbling around the rocks and it's very, very difficult. But otherwise, fine. And O'Donovan, a master tactician, he knows he's still well ahead taking in his time from yesterday and looking extremely good for tomorrow. <laughs> Gina Vaughan, popular competitor and just happy to be home. Encouragement there from O'Donovan, letting Jackie know she's just 10 minutes behind Gina Vaughan as she approaches the finish here in Braemar. So, race organiser Jim Stark there, every reason to be pleased. All of the runners have tackled the route today head on. Many though finding the conditions much tougher than they'd expected. But that, of course, is what Coast to Coast is all about. Time spent kicking around the campsite is put to good use by coast-to-coast -coast athletes, those with enough energy always eager for a bit of a knees-up. And after two days of camping, life in the open, with neighbours only a tent peg or two away, cooks up a community spirit among the competitors. This athlete says a stir-fry could be the recipe for success to guarantee a good night's sleep. I'll go to bed about 9 o'clock because we've got a pretty early start tomorrow and I know I'll get to sleep earlier. But... Um... It makes it difficult if you want to have a mid-afternoon kit because it's too light and there is a fair bit of noise around. But um, Friday night was a bit of difficulty. Everyone had a lot of difficulty sleeping on Friday night. But last night, I don't, I don't think you get too many people that said that being in a tent made their night's sleep any more fitful, other than it was freezing cold. It's been a tough two days for the athletes gathered in Braemar. 
but some are still looking forward to further punishment. I've, I've done very little training. I only decided to do this 10 days ago. So, so you'll be sore tomorrow? Um, not in the canoe, because the canoeing's my my strong points. Of course, dreams can be shattered, and then there's always the problem of what to do with those noisy neighbours. So let's hope the athletes do eventually get a good night's sleep. They'll need all the energy they can muster for day three. The final leg to Aberdeen, all the action coming up in the Benneke Whiskey Coast to Coast after the break. Pressure is increasing for the competitors. There's an air of anticipation now. The athletes know they can't afford to let the wheels come off their challenge today. Keeping race hopes afloat is important today too. The less optimistic of the coast-to-coast -coast canoeists adopting a sink or swim attitude to what lies ahead. It's uh, the second canoe I picked up and it leaks more than the first canoe. <laughs> so it's got elastoplast all over the bottom. <laughs> Even going down, that's why. Are these then condemned men eating a hearty breakfast? Possibly so, says our race analyst Fraser Klein. They've had two days of competition, and everybody's getting a little bit tired now, so uh, it's beginning to, to hurt. But on the other hand, they know that they're on the final stage and they're, they're almost there. I think John O'Donovan, obviously, is in pole position. He's very good on the bike and he's a former international canoeist, so. Barring a, a major catastrophe, he's got to be the favourite to end up first at uh, Gerdelness. Day three for the competitors sees all three triathlon disciplines in use with a 71-mile target ahead of them. They roll out from Braemar on bike, heading down Royal Deeside, across the Invercauld Bridge, passing Balmoral Castle before completing their 45-mile cycle ride. The first transition of the day takes place with the field switching from bike to canoe and a 24-mile paddle down the Dee, one of Scotland's premier salmon rivers. Then it's into Aberdeen and the final leg of the day and the event. Their last challenge is a two-mile run which ends at the Girdleness Lighthouse, Scotland, coast to coast. Here we go then, day three, a rolling start behind the pace car, making sure that for the first few miles, the cyclists get a chance to just spread out, reach a speed they're comfortable with, and avoid the kind of bunching which in the early stages of a race can lead to some dangerous situations as the riders jockey for position. Up with the leaders, still the pace car dictating events, the top of the field waiting anxiously for the chance to break. Fizarro and Chris McSweeney on the left of camera, Jackie Shand just tucked in there behind O'Donovan. Passing the Invercauld Bridge, streaming round the bend here, building up speed all the time. Now, with no pace car to hinder them, the pack leaders starting to power up. No surprises really, O'Donovan pushing on, dictating the flow. And there goes Fromentil, pulling over to the side of the road, looks to be in serious difficulty. Not a second glance though from the pack as they push on towards Ballater. Back with the Frenchman, and oh dear, this really is sad. Exactly the same thing happened last year on the same stretch of road. The problem is that I gave my spare tire to another guy and don't have nothing to repair. Not again. 
There's just a big noise on the um, on my way out. Uh, beautiful day, isn't it? Approaching the Pass of Ballater now, and John O'Donovan still out in front. The chasing pack extremely close behind, though. The race and the pace really hotting up. As they emerge through the trees, you can see from our helicopter, it's still O'Donovan heading up the pack. The motorbike crew heading past the pack, revealing many still together at this stage. Gina Vaughan looking fairly comfortable, settling into her stride. At Duddesbridge, an army of backup crews are waiting there to ensure as smooth a transition as possible for the triathletes as they take to their kayaks for the journey downriver to Aberdeen. Approaching the bridge now, and the fun and games about to begin. The athletes desperate to get waterborne. Scrambling down the banking, hoping for the smoothest of transitions, but the potential for utter confusion. How's it going, John? It's going fine. Except for just what happened on the bridge, it was like a stampede. It was like uh, Noah and the Ark. All the animals disappearing. They just ran over me. 17 miles ahead of them now. A hard paddle if they're to make the distance count. The river hasn't seen much rain lately. They're going, well, it'll be pretty slow in places. Approaching Park Bridge, Garth Cooper, well out in front, said he was looking forward to the kayak section, easily making up for lost time here. Coming through in eighth place, O'Donovan didn't get the best of changeovers at Durris, felt he was held back a bit by some of the other competitors, but he's got to put that out of his mind now and concentrate on his stroke.
Under the bridge at Aberdeen Boat Club now and Garth Cooper has made great time. Won't have found the camp conditions today too much of a test. No messing about in the river here. Cooper quickly into his stride for the two-mile run to Aberdeen's Girdleness Lighthouse. Here's another New Zealander, Glenn Anderson. He's taken part in his country's coast to coast no less than seven times. O'Donovan getting some assistance from the officials. Conditions at the water's edge pretty treacherous. Wouldn't want to slip up here. There it is, the Girdleness Lighthouse, an unmistakable landmark as Garth Cooper nears the finish, the completion of a 190-mile slog across Scotland. Do you prefer the cycle? Um, I prefer the canoe. A traditional Maori chant to spur him on, and I'm sure a welcome reminder of home. Very hard. Um, it was a matter of pacing myself, really, the, the whole time. I um, started off slowly in the cycle and the run days and then just picked people up because you feel a lot better um, passing people rather than being passed. Chris McSweeney nearing home, just three minutes behind Cooper, really has put in a sterling performance over the past three days among the front runners throughout. I wish I could run like this yesterday at the end. Back at the boathouse, Jackie Shand, glad I'm sure to be nearing the end now, been putting in a lot of canoeing practice and she's turned in a good stage. I've come half over in the world to run this last K. How'd you feel? Can't repeat it on television, mate. So Glenn Anderson takes third place today, and he'll be quite happy with that. O'Donovan then, victory in sight. It's been a cool, calculated performance from him. He's never looked in trouble, but the chaotic scenes at Durris still preying on his mind. <laughs> There's a lot of people that are not getting any paints tonight, I'll tell you that. Did you fall? No, a couple of them ran over me. And they're haste to get to the boat, you know? After about 180 miles, they were still in a hurry. Great competitors, that lot. And none greater than O'Donovan himself. Two races coming up within a few weeks of this. Says he's trying to conserve energy. There surely must be easier ways than this. Jackie Shand then crossing Scotland in a total of 14 hours, 2 minutes and 44 seconds. The support team's obviously pleased to see Julian Charles Day. Gina Vaughan, the final gradual climb to the finish, couldn't quite close the gap on Jackie to retain her title from last year, but the two of them have helped make the women's race very competitive indeed. Antonio Fizarro told me yesterday how much he's enjoyed this event, made a lot of good friends, and really is quite a popular character. Let's hope he's back next year. Of, um, back up. But today and the last three days belong to one man, 47-year-old John O'Donovan. A veteran competitor he may be, but he showed the youngsters in this top-class field 
that training, pace and planning amount to so much when the distance involved is so great. Coast to coast in association with Taizo. Start the adventure here.